Go. Welcome back to Creative Chaos. I'm Jen Clymer, and I am thrilled to uh, introduce yet another episode of one of our favorite shows. It's Inside Hollywood with Hawk Koch. Let's go to Zoom and see who he's got for us today, shall we? Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Hi, Freda. Hi. Hi. Today is so exciting, and it's really exciting um, for several reasons. It's merging inside Hollywood with behind the book, which is my very favorite thing to do. Um, and Hawk will ask all of these great questions, but I loved Jane's book, Happy Accidents. And I hope everybody does read it because it really gives you a lot of context um, into the roles that she's had from the Chris Guest movies to Sue Sylvester, to game shows and I hope uh, there will also be some time spent on Marlene Marlene, Queen of Mean, um, her children's book, which was also wonderful. Um, so over to Hawk. And thank you, Jane, very much for um, accepting his invitation. Well, See you thank later. you and hi to all the residents and our Facebook friends and anybody else who happens to be watching. And I am honored. Uh, to uh, speak with a really talented actress and comedian, Jane Lynch. Most of you know her from the Chris Guest films, My F Best in Show, uh, Mighty Wind, uh, and the others, and of course, the acid-spewing, cheerleading coach, Sue Sylvester in Glee. Jane only has five primetime Emmy Awards with 22 other wins, and I counted them up, 40 nominations. But aside from all that, I got to know her a lot deeper as a person by her courageous and open memoir, Happy Accidents. <laughs> Hopefully, you will all get to know her more through this interview and discover, as I did, what an outstanding and genuine human being Jane is. Jane has also been a big supporter of MPTF, and I'm proud to introduce her to you. So welcome, Jane. Come on in. Hey, 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 I didn't want to get there, there before is. my 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 uh, introduction. I, I was a little uh, excited to come on, but here I am. Good to see you, Hawk. <laughs> nice to see you, Jane. So, you know, we worked together on a not great movie called Collateral Damage right. uh, with Arnold Schwarzenegger many years ago. And that was the yeah. first time I think I got to actually spend time with Jane. So, yes. um, and thanks for allowing me to interview you. And I love that you had a dream as, as a child to be an actress. And through trials and tribulations, hard work, a bit of luck, uh, as an actress and a human being, your dreams are being fulfilled. And I think that's, a lot of people don't get that. And I'm, no. I'm excited for you. Mm -hmm. um, you're from a small town, Norman Rockwell type, Dalton, Illinois. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your family and your upbringing. Singing and drinking were big components, as I recall. Indeed, I'm from the south side of Chicago. It's a little suburb called Dalton. And it was a prairie right before we moved in. We were one of the first uh, houses built in this little subdivision. And my dad, um, you know, we're Irish Catholic, Southside Irish, which is a particular thing in Chicago. And it, um, my grandparents were, uh, um, Irish immigrants. And, um, you know, the my, because my dad was first generation, he was uh, very close to the Irishness of it all. And he loved story. He loved having a drink. He loved hanging out with his, you know, the fellow Irish Catholic people. And a lot of them uh, moved to uh, Dalton, our little town. And we um, were all at the same parish, St. Mary's and St. Jude later. Um, and uh, there was a lot of singing around the kitchen table. There was a lot of, uh, you know, cocktail hour. I mean, we didn't drink like 24 seven, but we were, we were pretty big drinkers. We, we enjoyed, and this was the cocktail uh, era. This was the kind of the Mad Men era. So five o'clock in the afternoon, my dad would look at his watch and he'd toast my mom and say, first today, badly needed. And they would have their first drink together. And by the time I was about 13, 14, I was joining them. And uh, it was a lot of fun. My dad was a great harmonizer. I have a very good ear for harmony as well. I was blessed with that. I got it from him. 
And um, yeah, so that's where it all started. A lot of laughing, a lot of having the neighbors come over. Christmas Eve was always a big deal gathering around the piano and Andy Climack would play the piano and we would all sing and uh, my friends would come over and their friends would come over. It was a, a great childhood. Wow. So now at five years old, you I think you, you saw a play or something. Where yes. did this dream of being an actress start? How did that start? Well, I was at a school play. I was very young. I was probably in kindergarten, maybe even younger. And one of the older kids in the neighborhood was doing a play at the elementary school. And we went into the gym. And uh, I remember sitting down. I remember the lights went down. And then when the lights came up, it was a whole different world. It was this magical, wonderful world. And I was transfixed. And I remember, I don't know what the play was, but I remember there was a bird in a cage. And I wanted so badly for that bird to fly free. I remember focusing all my attention on the bird in the cage, which is kind of metaphorical, I think, for, for all of us, you know, that we feel kind of locked in. And I remember, and the bird indeed was set free at some point in the play. And I remember just being so happy. But that, that was such, it made such an imprint on me. It was, you know, I was only five, so I couldn't make decisions like, that's what I want to do with my life. But boy, did that memory stay with me. So... A few years later now, you're 14, and Ron Howard and Anson Williams come to Chicago or to, close to where you were. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Happy Days was, I guess, big. Yeah. And uh, they gave you, I guess Anson gave you some advice? Yes. So um, I had written, uh, oh, no, no, no. They were in town promoting Happy Days, and it was the first uh, season of that, 1974. And Ron Howard was on uh, WGN radio with Wally Phillips. He was interviewing him and I called in and I said, oh, I was 12, it was 1972. And I said, I'm 12 years old, I wanna be an actress and I was just casting Guys and Dolls. And he said, good for you, stay in school, um, do plays in school. And Anson Williams said, I think you should uh, write Screen Actors Guild and get uh, a name of agents in your town, which is kind of impractical advice to give a, you know, a 12 year old girl in, um, <laughs> a suburb of Chicago, but I did it. And I, I wrote all of these agents. And as I was writing my letters, my mom came in and said, listen, I hope you get to be the best actress in the world, but just know not everybody can do what they want to. <laughs> That's a terrible thing to tell a kid. But you know, it, my mom was thinking that she was helping me and I burst into tears and I, I was like, I don't wanna do anything other than this. And my mom told me later, you know, as an adult, she said, oh, I regret saying that to you. And that was just, uh, I, she crushed my dreams. <laughs> Did any of the casting directors respond to your wonderful letters? Yes, I sent, uh, one of the letters I sent was to Universal and they, this was the only response I got because they did the Brady Bunch and I love the Brady Bunch. So I sent a letter to Universal Television and they wrote me a letter back the casting assistant and said, um, thank you for your letter. Uh, I, uh, we don't have um, a young people's department to our casting, um, but thank you for contacting me and good luck. And I hope to see you when you're older. <laughs> but I thought that was very nice. I remember running around the house just with that letter going, I, someone wrote me back, someone wrote me back. And it was encouragement and it was the kind of encouragement I needed. So now freshman year in high school, you actually are cast in a show called The Ugly Duckling. Right. And a uh, little stage fright there? Oh, well, what happened was, you know, when you walk up to your dreams sometimes and there's the possibility of it coming true and you get scared and you back up. Well, what happened was I was cast as the king, starting a, uh, um, a pattern of me playing roles originally written for men. And I like the second rehearsal, I remember the first rehearsal, I got a lot of laughs at the audition. And then at the first rehearsal, I didn't get one laugh. So I quit. Mm. I quit. I didn't admit to myself that that's why I quit. I was like, no, I want to play tennis instead. I'm going to join the tennis team. But what happened was I got scared to death and I walked away from it. And I kind of got a reputation in our little high school of being someone who was a quitter. So I didn't get cast after that um, until like, oh gosh, I don't think I got cast in a, a, a show. I, I did a show with the theater arts class, but they had to cast me. But yeah, I didn't get cast after that. It was horrible. Yeah, I've, always, I've always said one of my mantras is show up and mm -hmm. get, get, even though you may not want to do it, right. show up. 
Well, I learned that lesson. I learned that lesson and I never did that again. And I showed up every time in spite of the fear because living with the fact that I walked away from something I really want to do was harder than any fear I would have to get over. Yeah. Well, your, your memoir is quite courageous. And you say at a young age, you were, you knew you were different, but you had to keep it hidden. Yeah. It must have been hard for you. And tell us about if, if you don't mind, because I think it's fabulous the way you've come through all this, what, yeah. what, what your feelings were and you didn't know quite what to do because you didn't. Well, I didn't even have a word for it, Hawk. I, I and it, of course, is gay. Um, I didn't know what it was. Uh, I, I just knew whatever it was, I had it. And uh, I thought I was the only person in the world. And I remember a friend saying, talking about um, guys who like other guys and that they were called gay. And I thought, oh, I'm the girl version of that. I have that. It was like a disease. And it was something that was wrong with me. And it filled me with a lot of shame. And I didn't tell anybody. Uh, probably was a wise decision back then. And I lived with it. It was tough. I mean, I, you know, people live with tough things and, you know, I, and mine's no tougher than anybody else's, I guess, but, you know, I really have sympathy for, for people who have something that is a deep, deep, dark secret and they have to live with that. And um, yeah, it was really tough. It was, it was, it was dark. It was, uh, it, well, it, I felt like it was my fault. Yeah. Well, as a, not just that, but you also, and I, I'll quote here, uh, you said you, you felt like you were in the fringes of life, not genuinely a part of it. You never felt like you fit in mm -hmm. and you so wanted to. Mm -hmm. I, how, that must have been unbelievably hard to cope with because to, you, wanted to, you wanted to be you know, with the, the, the popular people or whatever and you couldn't, mm -hmm. never felt like you fit in. Well, yeah, I wanted to be comfortable in my own skin. I wasn't, I, I didn't feel, uh, I felt like a fraud. Um, I didn't have, I had one really good friendship and it was with a guy who of course was gay and we were very, very close. And I felt authentic with him and finding him, Christopher, was a, a big deal for me. He brought me so much joy and he was a really funny guy too. And we really got on, but I had a bunch of friends, but I, I was never intimate with them because if you get intimate, you have to tell the truth. And so I always felt, yeah, on the outside where I really felt like I fit in was in kind of the theater group and um, the choral group. I loved singing and I loved doing plays. So um, I felt more genuine in that. But uh, yeah, I, that would kind of be a thing throughout my life, feeling kind of on the outside, like I, if someone's going to someone's going to figure out that I don't belong here. <laughs> Yeah. And they're going to ask me to leave. <laughs> in a different way. And I just heard one of my best friends said to me ab about an hour ago um, that he's always, he's always hated being inside his own skin. And he's been writing a lot of poems recently. And he's around mm -hmm. my age. And he said, for the first time, I'm happy to be who I am as opposed to disliking who I am. Yeah. And I wonder... As you went, and we'll get to all the other stuff that went on in your life, but I, I feel just from the short amount of time I've been around you, that you're really happy with who you are. And I think that's a great thing for people to hopefully strive for, to be happy with the person they are. I think, you know, you're going through that crucible of um, not being happy with who you are and thinking that there's something deeply flawed about you. And then when you get out of that, it's almost like a, it's almost like a spiritual awakening. It's, um, you know, I was just, I remember I was about 53 when I had like a major <laughs> and I was just flooded with all this appreciation for not just who I am, but, but who I am in the world and who other people are. And uh, something just really clicked in. Uh, but before that, I mean, it wasn't like I was miserable until I was 53, but I, I was got out of a marriage when I was 53 and it was a short lived thing, but it, it really punched the hell out of me. And um, uh, the relief of that just, I mean, I found myself just fully embodied and fully in my heart and uh, it's just been it, it's just been increasing every day since. Um, so you know, I was oh yeah, good stuff. It is. It's good stuff. Absolutely. And you know, I, I I don't know that it should could have happened earlier. I have no idea, but it happened. And thank God. Well, uh, for those I know, some of the the members of the 
residents have read my memoir, but I got bar mitzvahed at 50 mm -hmm. because of a relationship breakup right. and it changed my life totally. Oh, and, and that was beautiful too. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, so you're out of high school and you go to the very well-known Illinois State College. Illinois State uh, University. Oh, sorry. State <laughs> ISU, yes. Uh, and uh, you, you, you start to get some parts in, in now you're, you're acting. Mm -hmm. and, uh, one of my favorite images is, is that you got to play in one of my favorite musicals, Gypsy. Yeah. And uh, you got to play a part I don't know if you'll talk about it, but one of my favorite, uh, one of my one of my favorite songs that I use all the time in trying to pitch a movie as a producer is, you've got to have a gimmick. Got to have a gimmick, man. Just and, like strippers. Mm -hmm. and, yes, and can you tell us a little bit about who you played? It's one of yeah. my favorite roles. I played Electra. There's the three the three uh, uh, strippers, and they counsel uh, Gypsy Rose Lee that she's got to have a gimmick. Well, well, what do you do? What's your thing? And one girl plays with a horn. The other one does ballet in her little stripper outfit. I played Electra, Electra, and I'm electrifying. I light up in uh, like a Christmas tree, and uh, so that was her gimmick. And um, I remember auditioning for that part. I didn't think I'd get it. I I believe I was a first semester sophomore. But um, I, I, I got up there and there's a really high note in it. It's a little higher than the, the other girls because they change keys in the middle of it. And I hit that note. I don't know where it came from. I hit it in my chest voice and I got that part. And I was like, I can sing. I'm a belter. I didn't even know. I can belt a song. <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. So now you can sing and you, you sound like... Jane Lynch and I sound like Hawk Koch, mm -hmm. but somebody told you to uh, learn the American Standard English. Oh my, my God, you, you really did read my book. Huh? It, you really did read my book with such precision. Um, yes, uh, it's uh, the phonetic alphabet. Can you give and us a little difference? Sure, sure. Yeah, difference between, well, you know, I'm from Chicago, so a lot of the things I say are kind of come from here. You know, my name is Jane. I live on 146 in Dante. And, and, and so I, I've kind of got a flatness going there, but there's actually a uh, American standard. Um, it's, it's a great thing for actors because it starts you out in a neutral place. And then you can add on top of that if you want to do a regionalism, but you should always have a nice, and I'm speaking in it right now, actually, you should have a nice neutral uh, way of speaking. And if it's great for Shakespeare, because you kind of, you very much want to be precise with how you say the words. You don't want too much, um, especially if you're playing one of the upper class characters. If you're playing one of the lower class characters, not it doesn't matter so much. But uh, if you really do it straight on, it almost, it almost sounds mid-Atlantic and almost, almost British. But if you go too far, then it sounds pedantic. But oh, it's oh. like a, it's like a middle ground. Was Hepburn, Catherine Hepburn, was she she was middle mid Atlantic. Yeah, she was mid Atlantic and almost British. So a lot of those stars from the 30s and 40s, the early uh, film stars, they almost sound British, and you know they say things like "murder, murder," I tell you. Uh, okay, all right. I I I don't know what accent I do. When I'm in New York, I speak like a New Yorker. You yeah. know, did you? No, Jew. Yeah, no. <laughs> Jew. <laughs> I love that. Right. Yeah. Jew. What can I yeah. tell Yes. Even Jews from California sound like they're New Yorkers. There's a particular, uh, uh, um, there's a kind of a, a dialect, a Jewish dialect, if you will. So at Cornell, I, I love this, this line because it's something that all of us, I think, need to do. And yet we don't do it often enough. Uh, she, she said to you, Jane, you have to learn to let things roll off your back. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, yeah. A guest teacher, um, Jajinski, I believe was her last name. She was from Poland. And I was, I get all wound up about things and I, I still do, but I'm, I'm able to regulate it. I think, I think it, I was actually upset about how somebody else was performing their role. You know, something that's none of my damn business. And she just looked at me and said, Jane, you have to let things roll off your back. And that stayed with me. And I think of that even to this day as I'm you know, outraged about Twitter or something. It's like, you have to let things roll off your back. Yeah. 
Well, now you did uh, in, I guess it was Lincoln Park, you did uh, Shakespeare in the Park in Chicago. Yes. yes. And I understand the first reviews were pretty amazing. And uh, you became quite a diva and started yes. to tell everybody how to. How to oh, yeah. Yeah, obviously that that uh, uh, advice that that teacher had given me wasn't a hundred percent installed in my person because I, you know, also I came, from, I was classically trained, if you will. I went to Cornell to a professional training program, so here I am in Chicago at the Chicago Shakespeare Company, and you know they don't have the benefit of my training. They none, no one's using the American um, standard, and uh, so I was outraged and insulted and let everybody know and finally I told we were doing a Midsummer Night's Dream and I said uh, to the the guy who was ahead of the um, program I said uh, when this show is over this this will be my last show with this company and he said well you're not going to get a gold watch that way and then he said don't let the door hit you in the butt on your way out yeah I was no fun we all couldn't wait to get you oh now, they were very very happy that inner diva I have seen I've seen it as Sue Sylvester. Yes. I've seen it on The Weakest Link, which I love. You yes. just tear those people apart. Yes. And well, I, I put that part of me to good use. Um, people, when I was doing Sue Sylvester, people would say, oh, but you're so nice. I was like, look, you scratch one millimeter below the surface of my skin and this monster will come out. <laughs> I was going to say, I think that uh, one of my favorite books was uh, Malcolm Gladwell's The Outliers. Mm -hmm, I love that book too. And, and what I was going to say is, you know, so many people go, oh, overnight success. Jeez, we didn't know, we knew a little bit about Jane, but wow, she did. Well, when you look back at all of your, your apprenticeship, mm -hmm. you know, from, from Shakespeare in the Park and then being on television for, for you know, in the middle of the night, home shopping. Right. Uh, and, and then... You know, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, the, the two, uh, Steppenwolf and Second City, you really had those 10,000 hours by yes. the time, by the time, you know, you, you, you got out. And then uh, you, you got, I guess, I guess you got one of your happy accidents, which is what your, uh, your, your play is, your, your book is called, mm -hmm. about uh, playing a, a a Brady Bunch uh, with Jill Soloway, who, became, right. you know, at that time, she, she was obviously talented, but mm -hmm. now with uh, with everything that she's done uh, has been become amazing. Mm -hmm. By the way, I asked if she would inter be interviewed. She said no. <laughs> I don't know why, but. Yeah, I don't know why either. She, and she, she's a great interview too. Yeah, but t talk about, about how you got cast in Brady Bunch and what mm -hmm. that how that kind of changed your life. Well, Jill and uh, Faith Soloy, Faith is uh, Jill's uh, sister and she's a musical person and she was our piano player for um, our Second City Touring Company. And Faith and I were very good friends. And through Faith, because Jill and Faith are so very close, we decided to do with a bunch of other people, uh, actual episodes of the Brady Bunch on stage. There was a, a, a theater company called the Annoyance Theater Company, and it's still there. And they want, you know, they, they needed shows. So uh, they wanted a show every night in order to pay for the rent. So um, he invited Mick, Mick Napier invited Jill to do whatever she wanted. So we thought, let's do this. We were all fans of the Brady Bunch. We all wish that we had grown up in a Brady Bunch type family, you know, with, with parents who completely understand you. And so we did these actual episodes on stage and the writing's kind of corny and it's not really funny. And, but you know, it, it's such a sentimental favorite of so many people. So we sold that place out every Wednesday night. And, uh, Someone, uh, The Fugitive was in town, uh, the, the movie The Fugitive uh, with uh, Harrison Ford. And one of the uh, casting people or one of the producers happened to be in our audience. Why they were there, I have no idea. And uh, from that, they offered me, my, the first offer I had ever gotten, they offered me this doctor role on The Fugitive. And it was a, it was a great role. I, I uh, got to work with Harrison Ford and yeah, it was a happy accident because it makes no sense how my playing Carol Brady on a ridiculous, sloppy, drunken show, everybody was loaded um, with a bunch of people in the audience, not only drinking in the audience, but smoking. It was a, it was a crazy party night. And then I got this role as a doctor in The Fugitive 
and uh, working with Andrew Davis. And, you know, it was a, it was just a really huge deal that made no sense. And uh, did Harrison give you any advice when you he did? Into That's very funny. Yes, he did. So we were doing my close up, and um, and in the rehearsal, I was uh, at, you know the cameras on me, and he's talking, and I'm listening to him like this. And then afterward, he said, "Hey, listen, no matter how smart you are, if you sit there with your mouth open, you look stupid." And I went, "Oh," <laughs> so I went. Because I'm supposed to be a very smart doctor. So now, of course, when I play someone who's maybe not so smart, I immediately do this. <laughs> little, a little That's trick a of the better. trade. So now tell me, you're, I mean, you know, you've, you're working with other actors, but it's Harrison Ford. I know. Crazy. And how was that first, I think it was at the craft service table or wherever, what happens when I, I, I'm still, I mean, I've met a lot of movie stars and directors and so right. on. But even so, I'm still in, I mean, I can't believe, you know, I got, I got to meet whoever it was. Mm -hmm. What was that like for you to actually oh. know that you're going to play a scene with Harrison Ford? You know, well, I, I, I was nervous as heck, but there was a part of me that was like, if you allow yourself to be overcome with nervousness, this ain't going to work. You're an actor. You're an actor. You're an actor. He's an actor. He's an actor. And you're going to act together. So uh, that kind of uh, consumed my brain. But I was at the craft service table and I hadn't met him yet. And he came over and he said, because uh, there was a controversy about my costume and everybody got involved in it. And um, he said, are you happy with what you're wearing? And I just remember being blinded by the light. He was gorgeous. He was, you know, kind of soft spoken. In fact, I didn't hear him at first because I'm deaf in my right ear and he was on the wrong side. And I said, I'm sorry, what? He said, are you happy with your outfit? And I said, oh, yes, 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 very happy. But yeah, it was wonderful. And uh, there was a scene where uh, he wasn't happy with the dialogue. So he and I left the set because he, he wanted to leave the set. And he was Harrison Ford. He can do whatever he wants. And we went into his trailer and we worked it out. We worked the lines out. So it was great. And that he it would tr entrust me with that. You know, I look back on it and go, well, that's kind of crazy that he took this local hire from Chicago and said, you know, come back here. Let's figure this out. And we did. Not with Andy Davis. Not with Andy Davis and not with the writer. Just the two of us. It's like the, the actors will figure this out. Yes. And, yeah. Right. I understand that. So now you talked about you were drinking on uh, on the real live Brady Brunch. And you talk about how you were you you really suffered with alcoholism for a long time. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. You're a uh, 30 year sober. Yeah. And, uh, how how what happened that you were able to let it go uh, and uh and i just think that's fantastic but man that must i know some people who have tried and and failed how did it go yeah. how, how, what it, happened to change it to make what happened to change it it was truly grace i didn't i did nothing and i know other people struggle i woke up one day i woke up one day sober i don't know i have no idea how it happened and, and and you knew then not to take another drink yeah and i didn't want to something it was almost like a new person woke up that day i actually i it wasn't even waking up i remember i was talking on the phone to somebody and it hit me and i was done i was struck sober wow and and you feel i was at 30 years my god yeah, excellent. You know, it's it's it left. You know, it 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 left. Now I have to. Uh, uh, for about three years, I. That's why I kind of don't claim thirty consecutive years. But about three years there, I had a hiatus, and I was struck sober again. <laughs> so I'm the luckiest girl in the world. And and was your mom and dad? Did were they aware of you drinking and of you not drinking? Yeah, they were. And, you know, they, 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 till, you know, they're both gone now, but they didn't know that there was a problem. They didn't, they didn't look at me as having a problem, probably because they drank as much as I did. And so they thought I was kind of uh, maybe even faking it. <laughs> they were like, all right, well, if that's what you want to do. And so I couldn't convince them, you know, they, they didn't believe that I needed to. So there was another big life decision around, around this time. 
uh, with the help of, of, I think it was Nikki, your therapist, Yes. where you were able to tell your parents and your siblings and your friends that you were gay. Yes. Kind of, that was, I mean, you weren't, you know, 18, you were what, almost 30. 30? I was 30. Uh, 30. Yeah, I wrote, I, uh, at the uh, uh, direction of my therapist, I wrote a letter. This is back in the days when you wrote letters. I wrote a letter and I, I forget what I said in it, but it was very heartfelt and honest. And I put it in the mail and I called my brother and I said, mom and dad are going to get a letter from me. And I just want to prepare you that it, it might be, it might upset them. And he said, well, what are you sick? He thought I was, maybe I had cancer or something. No, I just have gayness. I told him I was gay. And he said, oh, Jane, hey, that's nothing. Don't, don't worry about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll let him know that the, it's coming. But he said, don't, don't worry about that. that it's no big deal. Did he, and it know? Was, Did he know before no. you told him? No, hmm. he didn't know. I, I think they all kind of suspected on their own, but they never talked about it. So and when you called your parents. Yeah, he called my parents, said a letter's coming from Jane. She's not sick, <laughs> but let me know when you get it. And my, my parents read it. They went over to my sister's house and they were worried about me. They were like, she's so upset about this. And yeah, it's kind of a shock. But um, I remember my dad said, um, my mom read the letter and said, Janie's gay. And my dad said, is that bad? <laughs> so he like wanted her to tell him, you know, how should I feel about this? She said, no, no, no. So they were more worried about me. So it went swimmingly, you know, it went, it went beautifully. Wow. And yeah. th that, th that first phone call with them? Yeah. Was it, was it, I mean, you, you'd been gay and you knew for a long time. Uh, uh, was it hard to make that call? Were you worried about what they were going to say? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, I think that if I had sent that letter when I was say 18, it would have had a completely different uh, outcome. Um, you know, things had changed so much from well, it would have been, say, 1978 to, to 1990. Was that when I was 30? Yeah. Uh, so much had changed, and um, it, at least in their hearts and mind. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal for them. They, they loved me, and it was, it was storybook how they took it. And I remember being very, very relieved. Yeah, I have, uh, I have two twin grandsons who are gay. Both? One of them, one of them was uh, no sweat, and the other one we all knew was gay, but never could could come out. And uh, he was in a play in New York where he played a gay person, and you know the playbills where you write a little bit about yourself. Yeah. And he wrote his basically coming out in the playbill, oh. so that that's how we all we're allowed to actually acknowledge it. Oh, isn't that so? Until then. And, and they're both terrific kids and they're great. Yeah. Kids, so oh, I, I, I applaud everything you do for the LGBTQ community. Mm. And it's great. Um, Thank you. Uh, now, uh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know if I told you, my wife is a, is a, a certified Jungian analyst. You did, yes, yeah. yes. And uh, you, you learned about Jungian therapy, and uh, I guess one of your, I guess one, uh, your therapist said, "Don't be afraid of the shadow." Yeah, it's where the most fertile material lives. Mm -hmm. I've, I, I'm sure you've used it in your life. Yes. Do you use it also in your acting? Absolutely. So this is where. Uh, I, I, I think the point where my acting went from being kind of this, you know, I, I she's go, oh, she, I'm good at this to it's something that became much more profound for me. And I think my work got deeper. Uh, my, when my therapist told me that she said, um, cause I was talking about something that I was, I I'm more pissed off about what other people do than what I do and people not following the rules. Um, I, I, I project all that crap outside. So she said, come not back. next yeah, exactly. Oh, I know. Look, you, nobody changes their stripes. I've still got that anger, but at least I know what to do with it. I'll write a monologue. Um, my uh, therapist said, write a monologue about this person that you're talking about, who, who, this person who complains about what other people do. 
And so I did this monologue that ended up being the opening monologue of the one person show that I did called Oh Sister, My Sister. And her name was the angry lady. That's all. And I, I wore one. I went to CVS and I bought one of those um, neck braces, those uh, things that you wear when you. Yeah, exactly. And I uh, put a patch on my eye and I had all these injuries all over my body. And I talk about how because I had been complaining about how someone passed me on the right on the bike path and how dangerous that is. And so I did a monologue that started out somebody passing me on the right on the bike path. And then I went on to complain about a bunch of other things and it ended in my own human. I don't want to go there because it's a little uh, uh, scatological, but uh, uh, so that, that character was a, uh, you know, the angry lady really got that part of me out and I laughed at her. I took her and I looked at her and I went, this is funny stuff. This is a funny person who is completely unaware of their own, uh, the, the fact that they can get over this stuff if they just put this inside and look at it and laugh at it. So that's what I did with her. Wow. I, I tried to find it on YouTube. I was very obsessed. Oh, yeah, I, I don't, to, yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't think we videoed. And you haven't, uh, you haven't performed it recently, I guess. No, I haven't done it in a long time, no. Yeah. Um, and so you're, you're, again, you're, you're doing after fugitive. I mean, you, you're nonstop, no matter what they send you, you're working. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're saying yes to everything. Yes. Why were you, were you why were you so discerning or not discerning? Actually, oh, so. I always looked at it as, uh, I, it's like being invited to a party. I wanted to be invited to every party. I wanted, uh, I wanted to work on anything I, and I didn't care if it was quote unquote good or bad. In fact, that didn't even factor into my decisions. So, so I did a lot of plays in Chicago. Uh, maybe they weren't great, but I always had fun. I loved the camaraderie. And then when I moved to LA, we moved to LA with the Brady Bunch and we did it at uh, the Geffen, which at the time was the Westwood theater. And um, I got an agent and started doing uh, guest spots on sitcoms. Now, and when we go back, you said you, you never felt like you fit in right. when you were a kid. Did this now all of a sudden, because I know, and, and for all of us at the Motion Picture Home, we're a family. A, yeah. a, a play is a family, a movie, a television show. We're right. all a family. So this now hopefully made you feel like, yes. oh, I'm not the outsider. I'm in with, with this family. Yeah, and they have to accept me because I am in the play. That's how I looked at it. I was, I was so afraid of being rejected, but you know, if you're a good actor and they want you to be in your play, everybody kind of has to like you <laughs> and they kind of have to, um, they, they have to accept you. So I still had that going on inside, but I, but to this day, even though I, I don't suffer from those alienation feelings anymore, I love the beginning, you know, getting together with that family for the first time, and then it grows, and you know, it's going to become these relationships, and and you know, then I walk away from them pretty easily. I don't, I don't feel like I want to stay. I'm, I'm always looking for the next thing. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I love that. So I was, I was very happy. I didn't like being the guest. I wanted to be like when I would guest star on like Empty Nest. I'd look at Dinah Man off and go, Oh, I wish I could be, you know, a regular. So, but still, I mean, I showed up for all of it. I loved it. And you got to be a family with them for at least a week. And uh, so I did a lot of that. All right. Well, speaking of family, uh, you've got to be part of the Chris Guest family. Yeah. Talk about how you met Chris and uh, how you got into his family. Yes. Well, I was doing commercials and voiceovers in, in the early 2000s or late 90s, <laughs> actually, in, um, in LA. And uh I auditioned for a commercial that I, for Kellogg's Frosted Flakes. And then I got a call back and the call back said, Christopher Guest on the bottom. And I had seen Guffman, you know, waiting for Guffman. And I went, oh my God, I'm going to audition. Christopher Guest is directing this commercial. And Flakes. yeah, for Kellogg's Frosted Flakes. And I got cast and, uh, you know, it was very much, it, it was in, improvisation, just very much like Guffman. And um, at the lunch on that shoot, he said to me, you know, I do movies. And I was like, yeah, I know that. And he said, and, and I would love to work with you again. And I said, I, yeah, that, I, that, uh, that would be great. And so I ran into him at a restaurant about six months later and he was putting together Best in Show. And he looked at me at the restaurant and he went, and he said, I 
forgot about you. He said, I have an idea. Come to my office today. He never says anything with that much animation, by the way. I just overacted Christopher Guest. Yes. Oh, I know, Chris. Yes. <laughs> Very flat. Yes. And so I went to his office, which was Castle Rock, which was right across the street from the restaurant. And I mean, he didn't even, you know, we kind of small talked. And then he said, so uh, I, th this is the character and it's with Jennifer Coolidge. And I think you two would be great. You're going to play, a, you know, this lesbian couple. And um, I want my producer to meet you. And Karen Murphy came in and she was like, hi, nice to meet you. I had the part, basically had the party. I had to check with Eugene Levy. And so I got a call that night at about five o'clock and they said, hey, you know, come out to Vancouver. And I'm in Vancouver right now. And I'm being flooded with memories of that shoot. Oh, and it's how different from, from what I understand, he kind of, he, he, it's like sketch comedy. He, he gives you an idea and then you go with it as opposed to really having a script with lines. What he has is he has like a scenario. It looks like a regular script, but there are no lines. So you know what is, um, what, this, what has, has to happen in the scene. And it's, it's up to you. You know, there's no rehearsal. You just show up and you start shooting. So you, you, you have to pack heavy. You have to do a lot of your own work. You know, you have to, and he really helps you. He sends you the wardrobe person and says, what would your character wear? You talk to the set designer and he says, what does your house look like? And um, so it's really actor centered and it's great that way. And you show up and Jennifer and I, because we were both new, uh, we were nervous. So we met ahead of time and kind of had some ideas going back and forth. But, uh, you know, we didn't we didn't improvise or anything together. So they roll the camera and you do the scene and the takes go on forever. Just when you think he's going to yell cut because you're you're out of ideas, you, you hear the the camera, it's still rolling. So, uh, you know, I got used to it. I, you know, it was a great way to work. I really loved it. And uh, you don't have to worry so much about how well you're doing because he puts it together at the very end. In fact, he makes your performance better sometimes than what you actually did by the way he puts it together. Wow. Uh, and then you, and then a couple of years later, you do Mighty Wind where you have to sing and play a musical instrument. Right, right, right. Well, I knew how to play about three chords on the guitar and, he, and Chris said, learn four. <laughs> so it's basically folk music. So really as Bob Dylan says, all you need are three chords and the truth. And um, uh, so that was my favorite, probably my favorite experience of my whole life was doing that movie because I love singing in groups. I love tight harmonies. And John Michael Higgins, who played my husband in the movie was also the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, he uh, arranged all of our vocals and all of the music was written by Michael McKean, Chris and Catherine O'Hara and Eugene. They wrote all the music, all the songs. And, uh, you know, John, uh, John Michael Higgins, who we call Michael, uh, he organized or, or uh, 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 arranged all the harmonies and they were very tight and very crunchy kind of old fashioned studio singer from the 40s, 50s. I just loved it. Oh, I, I know you, uh, I think with somebody later on, you sang Ohio and Carol Burnett. Yes, with Carol, because my when I first met my wife 25 years ago, her and her two sisters would always sing that song. So oh, I know, you know, oh, why, oh, why, oh, why, oh. yeah, 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 that's a great song. Yeah, it was so uh, much fun to sing with her. And, and uh, uh, then you get to, you work with Judd Apatow. How did you meet mm -hmm. Judd and 40 year old verse? Because you were hysterical in that. I mean, Thank you. Really funny. Well, I knew Steve Carell from Second City in Chicago. We were there at the same time. We were in different touring companies, but I, I knew him. And um, he has a wonderful wife <laughs> who uh, said, you know, your movie is all full of men. You should, you should audition Jane for the store manager. And so that's how I got the audition. And I auditioned with Steve and I, it went well and it was fun. And, and they cast me. So well, that was the how that happened, and Forty uh, Old Virgin was a you know a lot of improvising, and uh, it was a lot of fun, and we all came in almost every day. So even if you weren't in the script per se, you know Judd would call call you at any time and say you know get in there. It was almost like being on the uh, the um, uh, the bench on a basketball team. It was really fun. Does this say a lot about uh, maybe writers will be upset with the people who, who write scripts? Wait wait a minute, I, all these improv 
movies are big hits. Yeah, well, that's, you know, the, there was certainly a script and, uh, uh, but Judd was really great about, in fact, he fed me some of my best lines, you know, he like whispered them in my ear. He was all for, let's loosen this up and see what else we can find in here. Yeah, well, uh, we lost somebody who I know you loved and was one of my favorite people recently was Fred Willard. But yeah. you, you had, you got a great story about a scene you did with Fred Willard. Yeah, so um, <laughs> I was doing uh, For Your Consideration and Fred and I played the kind of Entertainment Tonight uh, anchors. And our first scene together, we're supposed to be interviewing the cast from this movie within the movie. And uh, Catherine O'Hare is, is one of the actors that we're interviewing. And I didn't get a word in edgewise. And Ed, Fred took over the entire thing. And every time I started to talk, he would stop me. But he was told by Christopher Guest to do that. It's also the way Fred works. He kind of goes on and on and on. And it's a beautiful thing. But I remember going, and Catherine O'Hare came up to me after the scene and said, you've just been Willarded. <laughs> <laughs> now, Levy and, and Catherine, you know, been winning Emmys and everything yeah. for uh, Schitt's Creek. Yeah, Which I think that couple kind of started way back in the Chris Guest days. It did. I, I think they were um, uh, they were also Second City Toronto together, so they'd known each other forever. But I do think that was the first time they were paired together. Oh no, uh, Best in Show they were paired together. Right, that's what I said. Best in Show. Yeah, best in Show. Yeah. 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 So uh, yeah. Oh, I have a funny. I have a funny story about uh, Catherine and Eugene. The first day of shooting for Best in Show, I had not met them before, and I was in the trailer. And they were about to do their first scene and they were looking at each other in the mirror as they're getting their makeup on going, you know, do you know what you're going to do? And she's like, no, I'm, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. He's like, oh, because that, you know, they, it's almost like comedy actors have to like, so that maybe in their own mind, it's a psychological thing we have to do. We have to be like despondent about our first, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I've, I, this isn't gonna be funny. Did you do any preparation? Me neither. And um, at one point, Eugene looked at her and said, well, I decided I have one left foot and that's all I have. And of course that was one of the funniest things in the movie. Oh my God, it was hysterical. Or two left, both, both. Oh, I just flew it. I have two left feet. feet. And then you yeah. cut to the shoes are two left feet. Oh my yeah. God. Literally we had the, you know, those shoes made. We oh my God, it was hysterical. needed two left shoes. <laughs> So from those kind of silly comedies, uh, you get to uh, you get to meet one of my heroes because I loved all of her films, Nora Ephron. Oh my God, yeah. How did, yeah I, again, either your agent or enough people had seen enough of your work that you keep getting to work with the best of the best. Great people. I remember the first time I met her was uh, she was coming out of the bathroom and I was going into the bathroom uh, at the Mighty Wind premiere at the Directors Guild. So <laughs> that was funny. We passed by each other and she said, you were so funny. And I said, I, I, it's so nice to meet you. I'm such a fan. She said, we'll work together. And, I, you know, you hear that a billion times, but still I was like, oh, wouldn't that be great? And then before you know it, um, uh, I, I get a call from her you know, personally, or it wasn't an email. Did we have email then? Where it was your tallest actress I know. <laughs> and I would love for you to play Julia Child's sister in my new movie. So, ugh. and then she said, you'll get to go to Paris. So I was like, I'm in. Well, one of my favorite Mike Nichols quotes uh, is, I think you have it in your book about Meryl Streep is she looks like she just swallowed a light bulb. Yeah, right. I, I, right, right. And absolutely, um, mm. tell us what you can, what you can. I've never gotten to work with Meryl. I've, I've been on panels with her, and actually had a dinner with her at the Hamptons Film Festival once. We were honoring Ann Roth, who was, you know, oh, the, co the costume designer, and she did uh, our costumes on this too. Uh, but uh, what was the was? Did you see a difference? I've been lucky enough to work with some damn good actors, mm -hmm, uh, yeah. including Ingrid Bergman, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, but did you see a difference in working with Meryl than with anybody else? Or how do you describe working with Meryl? Well, this is, was a function of the role too, but um, I, I'll bet this is just her all along. The, the absolute immersion 
and diving in. Now, there was nobody bigger than Julia Child physically and, and uh, exuberance wise. And so Meryl was, was quite um, contained when I met her. Um, she certainly wasn't, um, you know, she wasn't one of those, hi, you know, let's be girlfriends at all. She was very professional and very restrained and contained. And then uh, uh, action and she, woo, she was this, oh, and her heart is, it was so full. And, you know, we play sisters who adore each other. And she just dove right into that and the affection that she would give me. And, you know, I, I returned it. And, and uh, you know, I, I, one of the things that Nora did for me the day before I was supposed to shoot, she said, come in and see where Meryl is in terms of energy and her characterization so you can meet it. So I was able to see that I watched the monitor and I got to see how she was playing this character. So I kind of knew what I was in for and it was complete 100% immersion into the exuberance and the affection of this relationship. And um, it was a joy. I, I dove in, I dove off the cliff and she dove off the cliff and we held hands going down. Had you played a real life person before that you could research and find out who they were and I, really did? I did a very small thing on, uh, uh, I played Amelia Earhart on the uh, Scorsese film and it was cut. But so I did a little research, but that kind of doesn't count. Um, did you, no. I mean, did you do a ton of research trying to find out about I mean, as, oh, as yeah. an actress, I would assume. Absolutely. And there was, there's a lot about Julia, but there's also a lot about her sister, too. She was as, you know, they're uh, from Pasadena, um, but you'd never know it. They have that mid-Atlantic accent. They're, they're obviously from money. And they had that, you know, they've been through elocution lessons kind of uh, voice. But they were um, exuberant, huge personalities. And... My, uh, my character was two inches taller than Julia Child. So I was six, four and she was six, two. And we didn't put me in heels because I'm six foot to begin with. But Meryl had uh, had uh, uh, pretty big heels. Now, now your mom was a bit starstruck. Uh, there's a yes. there's a story you tell about the premiere. Yeah. My mother's Swedish. Well, she's Irish and Swedish. But this, I always say the Swedish wins out and she's very kind of, she can be cold, if you will. And she doesn't show too much excitement about anything. And I'm one of those people that's kind of a live wire. So she and I had our, you know, she kind of thought I was a bit of a show off. And indeed I was. Oh, it sounds like the phone's ringing. I don't know what that is. Oh, it's, uh, you know what? It's my hotel phone. Let's let it go. Um, yeah, let me take it off the hook. Hold on guys. And I'll get right back. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Best. You're the best. I love, <laughs> what I love about this is it's a conversation. It's, yes, I indeed. It. Yeah, I, I love the, how easy you are. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, thank so, you for letting me go. Your mom goes to the premiere. Yeah, so my mom goes to the premiere. And um, I'm, I'm on the red carpet, and all of a sudden I hear this crowd noise go up and, ah, and applause and everything. And I look over, and Meryl Streep has just gotten on the, the red carpet. Then I feel this whoosh of air behind me, and it's my 80 year old mother running as fast as she can to meet Meryl Streep. And Meryl Streep was taken aback because you know, you're safe, you're supposed to be safe on a red carpet from crazies. And my mother said, I'm Jane Lynch's mother. And she said, Oh, it's very nice to meet you. She was lovely, but I was like, Oh, and I remember running to go, ah, it's my mom. But she was so excited to meet her just beside herself. I, I have one red carpet story that I love. My wife and I had just been together a short time. Well, maybe not there, a little time. And I had made this movie with Schwarzenegger and we were premiering it in Westwood. And uh, uh, oh, God. Mexican actress, married a very wealthy guy, used oh. to go with Edward Norton. Oh, Selma, Selma. Selma. Selma, I apologize oh, if you're listening. Mm -hmm. Selma <laughs> called me and said, my mother is in love with Arnold Schwarzenegger, will you take us to the premiere of, 
of collateral damage. So oh, collateral damage, yeah. We all got in the car. We went to Westwood to the village, I guess the village of the Bruin. And there's the red carpet. And we get out of the car and we're going in and I introduce her, her mother to Schwarzenegger and Arnold was very sweet. But as we're walking down the red carpet, my wife is with me and she's standing a little bit behind me because I'm putting Selma in front of all the photo photographers. They want to shoot Selma, but I'm standing with Selma and my wife is standing behind me and the photographers yell to my wife, hey, clear the background. <laughs> <laughs> so cruel. I would have never wanted to go on a red carpet again. I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah, it's pretty horrible. It's pretty horrible to be the person with the with like the star. You know, like when I go places with my partner, they're like singles, singles only. <laughs> and I have to like banish my partner. <laughs> okay. Now we're getting to to you are just you're just rolling. And as you said a few minutes ago, you always wanted to have a, a role where you could be you could be not just a guest star, but the person. And you yeah. sign on for a pilot and you have to sign where you have a five-year commitment. Mm -hmm. And because you take everything, of course, right. you sign and man, this is gonna be it. But then your agent or somebody calls you and you get to, you get to read the pilot script for Glee. Right, I was right here in, uh, in, uh, in Vancouver, isn't that funny, in this hotel when that happened. You're at the yeah. Sutton place, I know, you gotta be. Right? Yeah, I am at the Sutton place. I'm in the little, uh, the, the residence. I think it's the Hollywood of Vancouver. It is, oh my God, it's a who's who in the lobby out here. Right. But right. yes, yeah, so, so what I got this oh script. Oh my God. Yeah. So I did this pilot and it, it wasn't that great. And, uh, but of course I just, I just want a job. So I said, yeah, of course I signed the, you know, signed away seven years, I think it is. And then my agent sent me uh, uh, Ryan Murphy, who I was friendly with and said that they have a part on you and uh, uh, for you on this Glee. And oh my God, not only did I love Sue Sylvester, but it was the sweetest thing I'd ever read. Uh, you know, I love music, I love musicals and it was so sweet and tender how they did that journey song at the end and how the can do they were. And, you know, we're gonna put on a show and I got to play the villain. And I said, oh God, I have to do this. And she said, well, they'll let you do it as a um, guest star until you have to go work on this thing if it gets picked up, that other pilot. So we're just praying, praying, praying that this other show doesn't get um, picked up. And so I do the pilot of Glee. And of course I love it. Glee is, Glee is automatically picked up. I think it was even picked up before we shot the pilot. And after the pilot, we were given three seasons three C that never happens. That's unheard of. So I'm not a regular yet. I might have to go do this. Not so very great pilot. Uh, so I remember the day being in my dressing room on Glee and I got a call from my, um, uh, my agent who said that she, and she never gets excited about things too, but she was like, <laughs> your pilot's not picked up. You're right. You get to do, do, do Glee. You get to do Glee. So I became a, a regular that day. Uh, I remember because this, I, I watched this with other people. Uh, the Fox execs, who I think took you to dinner, uh, said to you, "Your lives are about to change." Mm -hmm. Yep. Talk about talk about the difference between, you know, Jane Lynch the actress and Jane Lynch the star celebrity. How mm -hmm. that changed your life and what what happened? Well. <sighs> You know, truth to tell, and this isn't me being severely humble, it's just the truth. My life did change, but, you know, because I was 49 when this happened, it didn't, I had gone through kind of the, the hard knocks of who am I in this world and do I count? And, you know, I was feeling pretty uh, comfortable in my skin. So this was really just icing on a pretty tasty cake and it was pretty tasty ice, icing because when financially you're not worried anymore and you know, the financial worries stopped. Um, and I knew I had work for the next three years. I was being recognized on the street. What's, what, the, what's negative in that? It was really all positive, but it was kind of nice to see that it didn't add or take away from how I felt about, you know, in terms of my um, right to the air I breathe. <laughs> well, uh, but but 
what ha because you were recognized, does it come to a point where how do, can I go in a closet somewhere? I, I, I just want, I want to be able to go like I was. Uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman tells a great story about when he was walking down Upper Broadway about six weeks after the graduate the graduate opened, and he was with his wife at the time, Anne, and uh, it was a Sunday morning, and as they were walking, Anne said to him, "Dustin, you're singing." He said, "Well, it's Sunday morning. It's a bright, beautiful day. I like to sing." And they walked a little bit further and she said, Dustin, you're singing so loud. He said, it's a Sunday morning. I like singing loud. What's wrong with singing loud? A couple minutes later, she said, Dustin, it's the song that you're singing. And he was singing, here's to you, Mrs. Yeah. Robinson. Because as Dustin tells it on himself, nobody was recognizing him for the, from the, and the graduate, you know, it was a huge hit. And all of a sudden, as he was singing it, people were going, oh. That's him. That's, that's the guy from the uh, He never yeah, did yeah. The singing again because he can't go anywhere, of course. No, you know? I bet, I'll bet, yeah. But I'm um, just curious as to yeah. if you had those times where, you know, it's, it's lovely to be needed and wanted and oh my God, you, you know, you're my favorite. Will you sign my ear or my <laughs> nose or whatever? Yeah. No, no. I remember being in a Starbucks uh, shortly after, I think it was the 40 year old virgin. And um, I went into uh, uh, the Starbucks and I felt the place turn around and look at me. And I felt vulnerable. I felt uh, um, almost a little scared. Like I, 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 all of a sudden I, it, felt, it felt a little dangerous. And it also felt, um, what am I wearing? Do I look okay? Uh, uh, you know, when I, what, what, is it okay if I use my name on the cup or does it sound like I'm, I'm, I'm showing off? I became very aware of things that now I'm, I'm just kind of used to. I mean, I, I, I must say that the pandemic and wearing the mask has been kind of nice because there's a kind of anonymity that I haven't had in a long time. Right. Um, but for the most part, you know, I'm a social person. I also like being affirmed of, you know, of, of being a, a good actor. Right. And um, I don't even know if it's that they, sometimes people don't even know why they want their picture with me. I think just, it's kind of like trophy taking. Cause I remember I uh, taking pictures with people who, I, who will say, and, and what have you been in? <laughs> so they just took their picture with me cause they knew I was somebody, but yeah, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, I love when it's, it brings somebody happiness. You know, like uh, I'll notice like a family walking down the street and then they all stop and they turn and they look at me and and, and I'll say, that's not very subtle. <laughs> I know what you're doing. You're looking at me and, uh, you know, yeah. I'm kidding and I'm having an interaction with them. And I, I like that. Right. So now you get nominated for a Golden Globe. And you don't win. Right. But yeah. then you get nominated for an Emmy. Tell and us I about that that day. Now, here's this five-year-old girl who wants to be an actress. Mm -hmm. And now you're sitting at the, you know, other than the Oscar, there's mm -hmm. the Emmy. And Oscar for movies, Emmy for television. Right, right. Well, you know, it's funny when, uh, it's not what you th think it's going to, for me, it wasn't. And I'll tell you at the time I was, you know, I was in this marriage that was, was really a difficult situation. And I was with her at the awards and it really did, it, uh, there were a lot of things I, I could have been happy about that I wasn't because I was, my personal life was tough. Mm. And um, I uh, put on the happy face and I put on the, oh, I'm so excited, but it didn't mean that much to me. It, it was, uh, it didn't fix what was ailing me, mm. <laughs> which was, I was in a bad relationship mm. and, and I felt very stuck. Um, but, uh, you know, what, like I said, when that relationship went away, and, and it ended, it was like a, this rush of bliss came over me and I had appreciation for everything. And now I, I have much more appreciation for things. And luckily I got to win an, um, a, a, an Emmy after that. Uh, yeah. And yeah. you got to host the Emmys. And I got to host the Emmys. And that again was during the relationship situation. Uh, 
And that so was that tough. as much fun as you would have liked. Yeah, and Jill Soloway was my lead writer on that. Jill and Faith were my writers on that. Um, and uh, Mark Burnett was our producer. Uh, but uh, Jill was uh, in, I know, <laughs> whoops. Jill was in, uh, oh, I probably should. But anyway, she was having problems in her relationship too. And we both were like, we sh this should be the happiest day of our lives. And and it's it's not, you know, it, it was really... It was tough. It was a it was a tough emotional time, and it was tough for her too. Um, and now she's much happier, and I'm much happier. But we we you know we we ha we kind of had to muscle through that. Did she have any idea at that time about Transparent, or was that uh, no? We had just done a movie. Um, in fact, she was on. She was just on the Ascension. She uh, 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 we had to borrow money. She'll tell you this. She had to borrow money from her agent. She was in bad, in a bad place. And she and I had just done a movie, uh, an independent film called Ask afternoon delight. And it was really funny. And a lot of people, especially people in the business loved it. And, uh, transparent came after that. And, you know, transparent right after that is based on her own father who yes. be uh, uh, became, um, uh, a woman. Uh, he was 70 years old. Wow. And uh, she was struggling with, she had, she'll, she'll tell you, she had a struggle with that. And uh, this wonderful series came out of it. And she found peace writing about it because that's what Jill does. She writes about everything. She's one of those people. She just, she, you know, if something's ailing her, she writes about it. So I, on Glee, you got to work with, uh, you got to work with some of your idols. I did. Uh, you got to work, first of all, I, I did, I must admit, I did watch your, Madonna Vogue musical, which is hysterical. Oh, good. If I, I mean, do say so myself. All of you who want to go to YouTube and type in Jane Lynch uh, Vogue, uh, and you'll just, it's hysterical. You also got to sing physical mm -hmm. with Olivia Newton John. The biggest, my biggest crush of my childhood was Olivia Newton John. Yeah, this was crazy. It just, I named my dog after her. I had a, have a, the dog named Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> and again, they're just, they're actors just like you. So exactly. just like Harrison Ford, you know, yeah. where, hey, let's go in the trailer and, and write. Exactly. So I figured out how to do it. I, I you know, back with uh, Harrison, you know, I know what I, how I had to compartmentalize myself and let all of that stuff, the starstruckness live over here. And here we are, two people who are about to do something really fun. Two right. actors. Well, and I hope I hope I, I say this in the right way because you have admitted you're gay, and uh, we all understand what gay is. Mm -hmm. And you have kissed uh, in uh, in Best in Show. We see mm -hmm. a long shot of you and uh, Jennifer. Yeah, kissing. But now, I guess on was it Glee that you actually are going to kiss Sybil Shepherd? Oh, oh no, that was uh, the L word. Oh, the L word. Sorry. Right. Oh wow. yeah, we had to like make out. Oh, it was so uncomfortable. And I love Sybil. She and I think it was uncomfortable for her too. Um, but we became really close. You know, we were we helped each other through that because it it was uncomfortable. There's nothing fun about that. Well, I, I've done. Uh, I excuse me. Wrong. Wrong word. I haven't done any nude scenes, but I have been around many love scenes over my career. Yeah. And it always is the most uncomfortable thing for yeah. everybody. Yeah. For you know, everybody. I was watching uh, The Way We Were, I Told You This, Hawk. And one of the things that was so moving about it is how much they, uh, Barbara Streisand and Robert Redford's character, loved each other and their physical intimacy. Uh, I, I, it sure looked like they were into it, but, you know, who knows? No. <laughs> but it was so beautiful. Yeah, but it's hard to do. It's hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, and then, well, you did a movie and then, and then you get to sing Ohio with Carol Burnett. Talk about, again, that's another idol and yeah. one of the great comedians of all time. And we also did Clang, Clang, Clang Goes the Trolley. Oh. We did both of them. So yeah, that was really fun. In fact, uh, <laughs> when Ryan, uh, Carol approached Ryan uh, Murphy about being on the show and, and she said, said, whatever you, I want to be in your sandbox. I don't care what it is. What, you tell me what it is. He said, well, you'll be Sue Sylvester's Nazi hunting mother. And um, what song would you like to sing, Carol? And she said, well, since they um, 
live in Ohio and my sister Eileen is one of my favorite uh, musicals. Let's sing Ohio. So we did a beautiful two-part harmony of that. That was really fun. I just as an aside, I think that's why my wife, my wife's mother was in my sister Eileen on Broadway. Oh, really? And so that's why they know the song Ohio. I just, it just, I just connected the dots. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. My mother's name was Eileen too. And so my aunt would always say, yeah, my sister is Eileen. What I love about watching you all the time, and believe me, I watched all of you before I knew we were going to do the interview. So it's not like I just watched everything now. You always keep it fresh. You always keep it real. And you, there's what I love about great actors is there's a truth there. It's always true. Okay. And that's when people ask me, how, how do you know when someone's got the chops? I always just go, your nose tells you it's the truth. Yeah, and yeah. I think that I know you don't want to talk about other actors and what they're doing, but is there is there's a moment when you're in a scene and you're working with someone and you go, Mm-mm, they're not being, that's not true. And then there's the actor like Meryl or someone else who you go, Whew, yeah, man. Oh yeah. You know, when you're just, when you know, when you're in it, when the other person's in it with you and, and when you're in it and, you know, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I think one of the things that's, I don't put the cart before the horse. I, I always start with what is the truth here? What is, and, and specifically, what is the vulnerability of the person? What are the character I'm playing? What are they afraid of? What don't they want to show? Um, and that's how I can kind of infuse myself. And then it's never not true. It's always true. Yeah. Um, but if you, uh, you know, put the cart before the horse is like something like, oh, I should be really angry in this scene, but you haven't gone back and gone to the tenderness that is always underneath anger. Even for a sociopath, there's some tenderness, they're protecting something. What is it? And if you're familiar with what that is, I think it always stays true. And so, yeah, I, I like you said, you, you tapped your nose. I can always tell. And, you know, it's no fun playing with somebody who's kind of going through the motions and they're right. not that they're bad people, but no. they, they don't know. They did, obviously don't understand how to, that you start with the, you start with the, the gooey center first. Yeah. Um, is there someone you would love to work with that you haven't worked with yet? Is there a secret you can tell us that, oh boy. You know, I think one of the greatest artists, of, uh, you know, as far as acting and comedy goes is Jennifer Saunders from Absolutely Fabulous. And I don't know if I need to work with her, but I revere her. And, uh, you know, it, I, I, it, even the stuff, she, like the, the uh, absolutely fabulous, the, 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 um, the more recent stuff, of course, doesn't have kind of the charge of the early stuff, but it's still always true. And, and same thing for Joanna Lumley, too. But there's something about um, Jennifer Saunders that just blows my mind. So, like I said, I don't necessarily like, go, oh, I want to work with them. But, you know, I, I, I get a joy and it's such a charge out of going back and watching those episodes. <laughs> and also the French and Saunders stuff, too, I think is so good. Mm-hmm. Um, is what do you I don't know if you mentor at all, but what would you what do you tell some a young aspiring comedian or mm-hmm. actress or actress comedian? What, what, what would you say to them if they were watching now? I think um, one of the things that's happening with this business now is uh, we, you say words like branding and marketing and getting yourself out there. And those are all, that's the business of show business. The um, staying with the purity of the truth of uh, what compels you to do this. Um, you know, I, there was a barista at uh, the Pete's in my neighborhood who said, hey, I've got a new manager and, and we're talking about my brand. And I said, well, you've not even been in a play. You, you, you don't even know what the craft is. I said, stick, stick, read some plays, take an acting class, 
watch watch a lot of television why do you want are you what what horse have you put before what card have you put before the the horse you you have to figure that out so that's what i would say uh, you know and i i don't think there's anything wrong with how i did it in terms of saying yes to everything you know with it you know you, you don't want to be dangerous and do something where you're going to be at risk you know at, at risk or danger but i think every experience is a good experience because it's experience so one of my favorite things to do is play charades. Mm -hmm. And uh, were you a game player? I mean, game night. I love game night uh, just because I love games. Yeah. Whether it's crossword puzzles or playing games, we do something called running charades, which is- Oh, I've done that. Hysterical. Yeah. Uh, with all the acting and all this, why, why choose to say yes to to being the host of game night? Well, at first I didn't. Uh, Sean Hayes is the producer and I was in the middle of Glee and uh, he, we're friends and we were having dinner and he said, look, I've got this show. It's six episodes to air. You know, it's gonna be on television. Um, would you like to host it? And I was like, I don't think so. I don't think that that's something I wanna do. And then the next morning I woke up and I went, six to air? It, it's gonna be on TV, you know, just do it. And so I called him, I said, yeah, I wanna do it. And also the idea of uh, being a host, which I love, actually love doing. I love, uh, I love ha throwing parties and I love, I'm kind of like Jay Gatsby. I kind of stand on the balcony and watch everybody else have fun. I don't necessarily like going to parties. So I thought I would love to be, you know, the, the, the herding cats for this show. And it turned out, I love it. It's, it's one of my favorite things in the world. I am so glad that he asked me. And from that, did, because you were such a good host, is that why Weakest Link came to you? How did mm -hmm. that? Oh, yeah. The, the second I heard that, you know, they wanted to have lunch, I was like, I I'm in. I, I, I know I want to keep my cards close to my vest, but I'm in. And I'm in. did you know ahead of time that you were going to just rake these people over the coals? Well, you know, Ann Robinson was so that she was my example of how to host this show. She has her own brand and it, it's very harsh. And she's like a British school marm. So that's her thing. And, and I have my thing, you know, um, uh, and I have this great executive producer who's always, I've got an earpiece. He's always telling me horrible things to say to them. <laughs> so he helps me out too. But uh, uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, it's not all him. A lot of it's me too, but he's, boy, he's there. He's meaner than I'll ever be. Really? Yeah, yeah. So now what's, is there, is there a dream job? Is there... Let me see if I can ask this right. Have you read a book or a story or a newspaper or something that, mm -hmm. have you thought about being a producer and going, ooh, I wanna do this piece or are you producing? Maybe I don't know that you are. No, um, uh, it's, uh, any, I, anytime I try to like produce something where I go pitch something, I've done it like three or four times, it's never worked out. So I, I do better when people come to me, it seems. But I just directed uh, a campaign of commercials for the Illinois Office of Tourism. And I star in them and I uh, directed them. So I got to cast them and, uh, you know, I got to uh, have my hands all over, all over everything, the script and wardrobe. And I loved it. And I had a wonderful crew. We shot them in Chicago. So it's my hometown and it's a very professional city. They have terrific uh, um, film people there. So uh, it was really a blast. I just joined the uh, DGA, so I, I'm thrilled. Well, do you so do you think you'll do it again then? So maybe you'll. Yeah, may, yeah, you'll and I like commercials. I like commercials because they're short. You get to you tell a story in twenty two point two seconds or whatever that is, and I love that. Maybe I'll get confidence from that to want to do a bigger form. But I really love directing a commercial. Those short little things and make those great. Right. So what are you shooting up in Vancouver? I am in a kid's movie uh, based on the children's books, Ivy and Bean. And it's a series of movies. I think there's three of them. And in each one of them, and they're very sweet. They're very innocent. It's like um, there's none of the kids have cell phones or anything. It's good old fashioned. You know, the kids go to school, the teacher writes on the blackboard and they get into mysteries where they're trying to find ghosts and stuff like that. It's just very sweet. And I think there's three of them. And I'm the villain in this one. And the one, uh, and Jesse Tyler Ferguson was the villain in the one before me. So we're crossing paths. And Nia Vardalos was the villain in the one before Jesse. So we've uh, 
we've uh, both all uh, three run into each other. It's been really fun. Now, Freda wanted to talk a little bit about your children's book. Oh, sure. Talk about there. Oh, Freda, go ahead. Maybe you should ask the question, Freda. Hi, Freda. Hi, Jane. I was just wondering, since you do portray mean people sometimes, yes. um, what was the motivation for writing the children's book? Well, this whole thing about bullying um, and kids being mean to kids, and that has always broken my heart. I'm, I'm a cancer, a triple cancer. I have such uh, empathy and compassion for kids and animals and, uh, you know, disabled people and just that, that it's our responsibility to take care of them. So I, I wanted to come from the point of view of somebody who is redeemable, um, but for her own uh, psychological reasons, is a bullier, that that makes her feel, this is mean Marlene, queen of mean, um, that it makes her feel powerful to, to pick on kids. And so I kind of, and I was, I actually wrote it with my ex, who was a psychologist who, uh, uh, you know, had a good insight uh, to this stuff as well. And so that's where we started it from, um, uh, was that point of view of why would some kid find it more advantageous to them to be mean to other kids and just get along. And so that's what it explored. Did any of that come from your own childhood? Um, yes. You know, I always feared the bullies. I wasn't a bully myself. I was always afraid of being in the sights of the bully. And that's kind of what made me the class clown. That was my, um, my protection. Um, and uh, I always tried to stay under the radar from teasing and stuff like that, but my heart always broke for the ones that did. And there were times that I would stick up for them too. Yeah, it's a, it's a great book. And I think oh, thank that, you. Um, everybody should be aware of it and give it to their children, their grandchildren. Oh, whatever. thank you. And the, 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 the drawings, the illustrations are They're so wonderful. wonderful. Yeah. They, yeah. No, well, thank you, Fred. I so appreciate it. Thank you for doing that. You bet. And I'm going to bring back Jennifer Clymer, the lady who puts together Channel 22 and is our producer, director, Miss Everything. Extraordinaire, yes. She's got a few questions. I do, and um, before I get to our hardest questions of these interviews, um, I wanna say thank you because you were part of our 95th anniversary for MPTF. Oh. And, um, the trio was amazing. And I, I was one of the people that helped to produce that show. And when I came up to you with last minute lines, you were like, done. I did not know that we had all these, um, you know, connections because I did improv in Chicago at the you Annoyance. Did. Yes. I was the annoyance? Uh, yeah. I, Mick and I are friends on Facebook. I studied oh. under Susan Messing. Oh my God. Susan was in our commercial at uh, the Illinois office of tourism. I, the second you said that I'm like, she must've cast Susan. Yeah. She's a bud. I love her. Yeah. Um, Susan played Cindy in, yeah, in the Brady, in Bunch. Brady Bunch. Yeah, and Mick was Bobby. I didn't know that. Yeah, he didn't tour with us because he had a theater to run, but. Right. Um, I was one of the founders of the Playground. And mm -hmm. when we had our first year anniversary, which was the improv co-op, Mick was like, come to the Annoyance and celebrate here, so. Oh, great. Yeah. Tell him um, I said hello if you see him. I will, I will. So um, thank you for supporting MPTF and for being here today. Are you ready for two of the hardest questions you're going to get today? Yes, I am. Hold on. Shoot. What is your favorite movie? Oh. And then what is your favorite television series? Okay. Well, I'm going to, my favorite movie, um, mm, I have two, but I'm going to go with Ninochka, which is Greta Garbo. Well, of yes. course. That or ben Private Benjamin. Two of my favorite. Mm -hmm. so, I watched Manochka probably 150 times. Uh, we have not had Manochka on our list. We've been asking guests on Creative Chaos since March 17th, 2020. No Nanachka. No Nanachka, but. It's an old one too. But it's a great movie. Oh, isn't it? Oh, I've seen it. Garbo <laughs>, laughs. I had a secret fantasy crush on Garbo that occupied my entire person for about an entire summer. I didn't talk to people. I was so in this fantasy of her. I love it. Yep. Um, so then 
I think this is actually the harder question, Hawk. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Unless there was some. If she says the Brady Bunch, I'm going to be disappointed. Yeah. No, ahead. I won't. You guys, you know, I don't. Re Ugh, I watched television so much growing up, and I don't watch it much now. But I am. I just finished, and I'm almost depressed that it's over. I just finished Call My Agent, which is a French. It's. I think it's called in French. It's called Ten Percent. And there are these half hour um, uh, episodes, four seasons, six episodes a season um, with this. It's an ensemble show and they're all amazing. Uh, but it, particularly uh, Camille Cotin, Cotin, my, my French is terrible. She's fantastic. So do, do, yeah. you, do, you, uh, do you speak French so you didn't need to read the subtitles? Or? Oh, I needed the subtitles. That's an experience too, because Every once in a while, they'll say something in English. Because as you're watching and you're looking at the subtitles, they're speaking English in your mind. And then when they say something in English, it's, it's always striking because it's got such a heavy French accent. And you realize, oh, that's right. They're speaking French, but I, I'm reading the subtitles. See, I was hoping you were going to say absolutely fabulous. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I guess that would make a, a consistent sense. But let's put that up there. Let's say uh, absolutely fabulous and um but number one right now is, uh, and I just gave you the finger. I apologize for that. Uh, number one right now is um, uh, 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 Call My Agent. Okay. Um, you are not the first to say Call My Agent. Mm. You are, are part of a, a really illustrious group that mm. Call My Agent is top of. Yeah. Right. Um, I am going to leave to let you guys wrap it up. But I, before I go, I do want to say the love of improv is... Um, for me, the grounding of all great actors, because I agree. you have to jump into that truth and, and truly be there in that collective collaborative moment. Without net. And yeah, or it doesn't work at all. Thrilling. Yeah. Um, there is a Facebook question. Um, Go ahead. Go ahead. Rocky, Rocky would like to know, are there any plans to bring the Two Lost Souls show to LA and Palm Springs later this year. Well, I wish there were, we don't have a, a date in Palm Springs. We're gonna be all over the country. That's the show I do with Kate Flannery, who was part of the trio. Kate okay. Flannery was married at the Drunk in the Office, which is another great television show. And she and I have been singing together since, oh my God, our annoyance theater days. So that's like the late eighties, early nineties. And we have a four piece band, an amazing little jazz quartet. And we uh, do, you know, Two Lost Souls will give you an idea that that song is basically the era we're in. Damn Yankees. Uh, yeah, yep, Dan Yankees is right. And, uh, yeah, we do a bunch of songs from like the late 50s, early 60s, and it's a lot of fun. Well, hopefully when people get their, um, you know, minds sorted and everything is safe and the, and the campus opens up again, maybe yeah. you can add, this stage on Jeff's campus. We wouldn't charge you a penny. We would do it for a, not, probably wouldn't pay us a penny, but we would love, love to do it. Excellent. I'll see if I can find a really good producer for that. Oh, good. wait, there's a good producer right here. All right. Thank you. Who knows, who knows all the songs? Yeah, yeah, I'll bet you do. I'm sure you do. My, yeah. my, my this wonderful director, John Schlesinger, Midnight yeah. Cowboy, Marathon Man. We worked together and he said, you're the only straight guy I know who knows every song from Broadway. Yeah, oh, isn't that great? It's good stuff. <laughs> yeah, all our stuff is duets too. That's why we call it Two Lost Souls. All, all I can tell you is I've had so much fun today thank and I, I so thank you. You've been so open and willing to do, to do this and thank you again for supporting the fund and uh, just, I had a ball and I hope you had fun. I, I have. Thank you, Hawk, so much. And I so enjoyed reading your book. It was just a, a, just a, a, a wonderful journey. And uh, I, I told you I watched Chi uh, Chinatown and uh, The Way We Were because I was so inspired. And they're beautiful films. Well, thanks. Have a lot of fun playing a villain in Vancouver. And uh, hopefully I'll get, to, when we're out of all of this stuff, maybe I can come to one of your Gatsby parties. That would be great. <laughs> and play and play a game. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Wonderful. Running charades, yeah. Goodbye. Right. And thanks, Bye everybody. Now. See you Thank soon. You.